Hello and welcome to ESMARConf 2023 and the Barriers to Open Synthesis and How to Remove Them session. This session was pre-recorded because of speaker availability and you're now watching on YouTube. Automatic subtitles should be available now and we'll work hard to get these manually verified as soon as possible. If you have any questions for our presenters, you can ask them via the at ES Hackathon Twitter account by commenting on the tweet about this session. If you registered for the conference, you can also comment and chat with other participants on our dedicated Slack channel. We will endeavor to answer all questions soon after the event. We would like to take time to draw your attention to the, our code of conduct, which is available on the ESMARConf website at www.esmarconf.org. So thank you all for joining us today for this session. Um, I am Emily Hennessy, and I'm an Associate Director of Biostatistics at the Recovery Research Institute at Massachusetts General Hospital and Assistant Professor at Harvard Medical School. I will moderate today's session. We have a wonderful panel, a set of panelists for this session, and I'm going to ask them each to introduce themselves, um, starting with Tim Arrington. Great. Thanks, Emily. Thanks for the invitation. So I'm Tim Arrington. I'm the Senior Director of Research at the Center for Open Science, uh, which is a nonprofit that's based in Charlottesville, Virginia. And I'm in a former life, I was a preclinical cancer biologist. But since I've been at the center for about 10 years, I've become a meta scientist, kind of studying the scientific process. I think one of the things I'll, I'll mention that probably hopefully comes through as we continue this panel from my perspective is what we do at the Center for Open Science, which is trying to increase increase openness across that whole life cycle of the research. So not just data, not just publications, but all the processes that play a role. Um, and that's a really huge part of what we're trying to do to serve our mission. Great, thank you. Okay, I think I'm next. Uh, thank you, Emily, uh, for the invitation. And it's wonderful to be um, on this panel with, with colleagues and I'm very much looking forward to it. So I'm David Mower, I'm a professor of uh, epidemiology and public health at the University of Ottawa, which for those who don't know is the capital of Canada. So I've conducted hundreds of systematic reviews, um, developed the first iteration of PRISMA, which is really getting at the notion of transparency. And um, I've been um, a co-editor in chief of systematic reviews, the journal systematic reviews for a decade. And I've led um, and lead and a member of lots of different uh, projects on trying to develop a culture of open science. Great, thank you. Oh, EY, I think you're on mute. Okay, oh, sorry. Um, thank you for the invitation, Emily. Um, it's nice to be here. I'm EY Moon. I'm a professor in the School of Public Health at the University of North Texas Health Science Center. Since 2010, I have directed an NIH-supported synthesis project called Project Integrate. My team and I obtained individual participant data from original investigators and synthesized data to provide evidence regarding brief alcohol interventions for young adults. My team and I have also developed statistical methods to combine individual participant data from heterogeneous studies. Last year, uh, we competed for the NIH DataWorks Challenge, and we were honored to be a finalist team. Great, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Sho Tsuji. Thank you so much for the invitation as well. Uh, I'm an assistant professor and the director of the Baby Lab at the International Research Center for Neurointelligence at the University of Tokyo. And my bread and butter is really being a developmental psychologist, but I see open synthesis as an integral part of my work. And I, like many people in my generation of psychologists, got into the topic because I grew up in the replication crisis. Uh, and I realized that it's important to synthesize over evidence, especially in the field with very small and noisy samples like infant studies are. Uh, and so I started a platform called MetaLab together with colleagues, which is an open synthesis platform uh, about uh, meta-analysis on cognitive development. Great. Great. Thank you all for those wonderful introductions. Um, this is a panel discussion, so I am going to try not to dominate the conversation. I did just want to set the stage so that everyone who is listening 
um, can have a good kind of base understanding of what we mean when we say um, open synthesis. So I'll, I'll briefly go over what we mean when we when we use the term open synthesis. Um, and hopefully if I am incorrect in my assumptions here, the panelists will um, gently guide me to the correct definition of open synthesis, um, but then also really uh, give a brief overview of who maybe the key stakeholders are and when we're talking about this. Um, and so Neil Hadaway and colleagues um, recently put together a um, wonderful graphic on kind of the different components of um, an open synthesis framework. And so, so essentially, if we think about it, if you're a primary researcher and you think about what it means um, to be, you know, an open scientist of a primary study, um, it's really kind of taking some of those key elements and bringing that to, to the synthesis world, the systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Um, and so there's lots of different ways that syntheses can be open. That's through kind of open collaboration um, with, with folks kind of across different nations, different disciplines, um, having there be opportunities um, for open discovery through um, search engines that enable bibliographic searches of databases that are easy to use and navigate and provide access to you know, all the potential primary studies that could be a part of that process. Um, Obviously, when we're talking about open synthesis, the emphasis, some of the emphasis is going to be on having open methods and, and transparent reporting of those methods and the, and the data that comes along with that. Um, and so there's kind of lots of pieces to this process. I'm not going to go through all of them because it could take the entire um, the entire conversation, basically. And I really want to hear from our esteemed panelists. But essentially, what I what I want um, folks that are starting this panel with us to, to take away is that the idea behind open synthesis is that we have um, a synthesis ecosystem where um, where there's a free exchange of ideas and data and methods and it's it's very transparent it's replicable um, and ultimately it kind of will hopefully um, improve the the process um, for for everybody involved. Um, so with that in mind, um, kind of jump starting into the conversation, what I wanted to know from from this set of panelists with diverse experiences but all with expertise in this area. Um, you know, why is it important for, for the field, you know, broadly uh, of science as a whole, and perhaps for your own discipline, why is it important to have open synthesis? And so I'll let whoever wants to jump in first um, kind of begin the conversation, if you will. Uh, maybe I'll just jump in with one point, uh, Emily. That, and maybe it's a different perspective um, from the other panelists, I don't know. But I think one of the reasons is to uh, respect and honor the views of patients mm -hmm. and, um, about having their data shared and uh, the research that's being done shared. Um, my discipline is um, medicine. And um, there is a growing data to suggest, if not indicate, that uh, patients are, have strong views about uh, the data that's uh, collected by them as part of a research project. And, and particularly around randomized trials, they want that data shared for um, additional studies, uh, and, and that the data can be used by other researchers. That's really important, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let me uh, chime in here. Um, I think the reason, the way I think is that um, um, the reason why patients wants to share the data for um, new knowledge is, I, I guess, in in it can be summed up as like we want to speed up uh, scientific discoveries, right? If uh, data is shared uh, at a faster rate and more widely, then we can actually speed up the uh, knowledge discovery. And also we increase transparency in data and strengthening public trust in data. And also um, in the end, ultimately, it saves time and resource for the field. So open synthesis, the way also Emily pointed out, benefits all stages of data generation, like ecosystems, and ultimately the public. We serve the public as a scientist. And in my case, um, for Project Integrate, we started to share data and computing codes in a public repository 
called Mendeley data in 2019. And we now try to share all the data and paper. When a paper is published, uh, Mendeley data tracks how data are being utilized. For example, the data and R code we shared in 2019 have been already used almost 900 times. And we also have a few citations um, stemming from um, data reuse from our data that we shared. And our data sharing practice is consistent with the FAIR principles, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So there can be a lot done to promote open science and open science benefits everybody. That's what I wanted to say. I'll add on to that. So first, I think uh, what David mentioned first about responding I think the patients um, resonates with me a lot because we work with babies where the parents come into the lab. They are normally normally developing babies, but still parents put a lot of effort into coming. They're very proud of it. So uh, they are often very happy now that we ask them whether we can share their data to, to agree to that, as long as it's anonymous, of course. Um, and then a more um, researcher-focused uh, view um, is that often, um, especially infant psychology labs, are often not so well resourced. So even though we want to collect bigger samples, it's very hard for us. So this is why open synthesis can be a way to collaborate or to build on past evidence um, without well, basically doing something that is not possible for us. Um, and the third point I want to bring up is that, um, in addition, what uh, Eung Yong said uh, is that I think um, um, open synthesis are really important uh, against um, biases we have in the literature, for instance, the weird bias like Western educated industrialized rich democratic country bias that we have and open synthesis is at least one way for um, uh, researchers working in countries that are not weird to get access to data um, without having having to pay for them. Mm -hmm. I'll just chime in. I think that's the all the points raised are great. Um, I think I'll, I'll summarize my point of view in, in simple terms, which is is to help us know what we know and what we don't know. Um, so I think you know we're always hunting to try to keep synthesizing data to get the best estimate at any point in time. So it's a nonstop game, right? We're always chasing ourselves, always looking for that next study. But I think the open part is critical and a lot of what you were just saying show, right? Like it was really important that we also know what we don't know and we shouldn't just like look at small studies or look at specific samples and quickly jump to kind of broader conclusions. We really do need to kind of think about everything that quote unquote worked and didn't work, right? Not just, you know, a, a narrow one. So this gets a little bit into the challenges we have in terms of doing that, but that open piece of really making sure we're looking at everything really helps us kind of, I think, collectively figure out where we should invest our resources um, to kind of keep, you know, honing in on that picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I think, oh. <clears throat> Emily, I would just add uh, um, another reason that I noted um, was the the notion of reproducibility mm -hmm. so in 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 medicine you know we have a a sort of a, a synthesis factory and and typically those synthesis uh, are are used in what we call clinical practice guidelines which uh, you know for example if uh, you know if i go to my family physician they may be uh, recommending a particular treatment or a particular screening period uh, based on a systematic review that's been included or used as the clinical practice guideline. But so the question really is, if, if those reviews are not reproducible, uh, are we going to run into significant healthcare problems? And if we take um, the uh, Open Science Collaboration seminal paper of 2015, where they're looking at primary studies, not synthesis, but if, if those results are anything reproducible with systematic reviews or knowledge synthesis, that is a huge healthcare problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it, it's a major, major problem. And really, you know, all the answers have, have kind of demonstrated to me, you know, the different levels of, of stakeholders and, and why there's something in it for everybody for there to be open synthesis. Um, but also, I think, David, back to your first point, um, you know, something that that I think is a misconception in this area is that is that individuals participating in these studies um, 
you know, are concerned about their data being shared, but actually, you know, what you've shared is that they, they, it sounds like that they want their data to be shared because they kind of see the larger, they can see the larger mission of, of what this is about. Yes. I think there's, there's two, at least two studies that I think are very credible. Uh, Michelle Mello uh, did, did uh, published a very nice piece uh, as did um, Kim. Uh, so there's, I'm aware of those two in, 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 in medicine. No doubt there's others that I'm just not aware of, but there is a, a growing perception uh, of, um, first of all, patients want this. And second of all, I think they're often the stakeholder that's forgotten, but central. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so, so knowing, you know, the importance of open synthesis, what, what, from your perspective, each of you kind of individually, what do you think needs to be in place for open synthesis to occur? And this, this can be at, you know, several different stakeholder levels. It can be more technical or, or more kind of practical. I would just love to hear, um, your thoughts on, on, on these things that would, that would help this happen. I I apologize for jumping in. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, it, uh, so I, I think, um, it, you know, what needs to be in place, I, I think lots of different things need to be in place. I think the, the first one is, is a culture, uh, is a culture of open science across research teams. I, th I think that's particularly important. I think um, we also need to have in place, for example, uh, data management and sharing plans. Mm -hmm. in, in medicine, this is quite complicated because uh, we do clinical trials, but we also do in vivo and in vitro research. And so they require quite different uh, data management and sharing plans. And so, for example, in, in Canada, they've recently mandated, they're sort of rolling out the mandate of, of uh, requiring data sharing, but <laughs> they, there's, there's not a lot of plans there that templates that people can follow. Mm -hmm. And so um, that that's going to become a barrier. So we need to close that barrier. I think for um, uh, individual patient data meta-analysis, we obviously need to have consent in place. Mm -hmm. uh, that's particularly important. And then I think uh, journals and funders need to require it. Uh, so again, in, in, in medicine, I can think of only really two journals or publishers, uh, BMJ Publishing Group and the um, Public Library of Science Publishing Group. Um, I think they're the two strong publishers that have strong requirements for data sharing. It's possible that um, Within an, a couple of years, the um, the uh, White House announcement, the OSPT, which is, I guess, the um, the um, policy group, uh, or will require by the end of twenty fifteen, they will require data sharing mm -hmm. uh, alongside any publication. So, I I think there's a number of different players in in place, and I. I hope some of those comments are helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you. Well, um, uh, David uh, pointed out a lot of good things, like informed consent has to be uh, stated differently to, be, uh, to begin with for clinical um, data. Um, I also want to point out the um, NIH mandated um, all the grant application going in from January 2023 has to have uh, data management and sharing plan in place. And there has been a lot of guides already out. Um, some of them involves like, things like uh, mandatory data or some other um, clinical trial would require the uh, depositing data to NIMH data archives and short NDA. So there are a lot of requirements going, um, there are a lot of requirements at the funding agency level as well as in the journal level. But I think what I need is um, more incentives. So if there are more incentives, even with that, it's not required, people will follow. But right now there isn't a 
a lot of incentive um, other than they say, I'm having an honorary badge of uh, doing an open research practice. There's a very little incentives. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, and kind of a, along these lines, a, a question I have, you know, obviously to do any sort of research synthesis, you, you need available data, right? And, you, and hopefully that that is open data. A lot of it isn't. And as a research synthesis myself, I often, you know, complain about primary study authors who don't <laughs> provide data openly. Um, but I've also found that other research synthesis are maybe not the best folks to be talking about the need for open data because they're not doing such a great job of being an open synthesis. Um, and so from that perspective, are there are there specific things that need to be in place for the folks that are doing the, the synthesis level work um, to make that open distinct from maybe the primary study data? I'll jump in. Oh, okay. go ahead. All right, I'll go first. You go. All right. Um, yeah, I think you're raising. There's two. There's two things that uh, that are important in here. One is right, like what can and should the, the synthesis community do to help incentivize and help promote broader open access to everything, not just the data, right? Like, like we know that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's way much behind it. And then there's the flip, which is as somebody who's doing it, how do you also, I think, embody those principles yourself, right? And I think that's a that that one, the, the two go hand in hand. It's just a question of like, who's the community really when you think about it? Um, you know, there's a Roger Pang um, kind of written an early article about this, thinking about computational reproducibility for those that aren't familiar with it. And, you know, there's a, if you ever kind of look at some of the ways they've talked about it, I subscribe to this, which is remember we're talking kind of in a different way, right? We use papers to communicate with each other. I do my research from the beginning of inception all the way out till I get to the paper, but the reader has to do the opposite. They start at my paper and they go all the way backwards. And so our job has got to be to walk them backwards, which is they shouldn't just trust what I say. They should, I should be able to show them everything that I'm doing. So that means all my decisions of where I get access to information is incredibly important. Uh, for example, right bibliographic data is a really important thing to pull on depending on what type of synthesis research you're doing um, a lot of those are closed uh, open alex for those who aren't familiar with it is a great open source alternative at bibliographic data right so finding ways to help promote and use those resources also is a way to kind of help kind of hit it both ways right you're demonstrating the need hey i need to do this you're making it openly accessible for whoever needs it is open source you don't need to have to pay for this or be at an r1 institution to get access um, and I'm trying hard to document my process. So a lot of these protocol methodologies are using registration, uh, pre-registration concepts to kind of mark what you've been doing the whole way. So that way it's not just a paper at the end and open data, it's open process um, and trying to use open tools and open data sets wherever possible. Um, I think that's the part I'd embody in that conversation, that idea of we're publishing papers, we're publishing positions, we'll say. And I, and I have to like have this conversation go backwards in time. Um, I think that's the thing to really be in place is can I do that and how do I do that well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my point was a, a bit of a more smaller detailed one um, because I think um, for me, it's often also a question of resources. I, I'm working on much smaller uh, scale open science projects. And so um, I totally agree about if there's more incentives from the top, for instance, from journals, et cetera, then resources will follow, right? So this is really, I think, where it needs to start. But given that right now there's not so many resources, um, I often perceive that um, there needs to be some leeway to compromise. For instance, if we talk about open synthesis and if I talk about baby video data, I can't just put them out on the internet, right? But still, so for instance, what we're trying to do in another project where we assemble a big corpus of online video data, we uh, try to think through, for instance, different levels of privacy. So this can be shared with other researchers, which is much more likely that parents consent to it and also ethically better because babies can't give consent by definition. Um, so on the one way uh, hand, we need more flexibility in what we think about when it's open synthesis. And on the other hand, I guess, creative ways and maybe like technological tools that can help us with that. For instance, we now work with face anonymization and background anonymization to make these data better for open synthesis, right? So um, I guess these are kind of ways that can also help us to have synthesis occur maybe in a bit different ways than, than the straightforward way. 
I just want to jump in and plug one thing. That's a really good point. And I think we do need to kind of get very clever. Um, there's a couple of examples that are interesting that, that I've definitely paid attention to. The Harvard University Privacy Tools Project is a really interesting one of trying to figure out ways of saying, hey, I can't share the data, but I can share metadata and I can maybe build ways to let you interact with that data in certain manners that won't disclose the privacy or the legality of the data that's hidden behind it. So I think we are absolutely right, right? We can get a lot more clever at saying, yeah, just because I can't share it doesn't mean I can't share everything around it. And so, you know, this open by default, but then close it when it doesn't make sense to me really resonates really well because we can't just have everything be open and we can't just say, oh, well, the data can't be open. So thus nothing should be open because that's also wrong. Um, so I think that it's really, to me, this is an opportunity to get more clever and find, you know, mechanisms that kind of address these types of issues that you're raising. That's so interesting. Sorry, Harvard Data Science Privacy Project. <laughs> so basically the idea is to disclose different data you have and which one of those you could actually share. Is is that right? Yeah, yeah. I, I wish you could have it in chat. Yeah, so you can just, if you actually just Google Harvard University Privacy Tools Project, you'll see it. There's another one out west too at Berkeley that um, I think Uber was involved with. But the idea is to create essentially Actually, um, you know, a protected portal so that the data is housed and that you can still see the metadata and, and partially interact with it. Um, again, you just have to put some boundaries on there because you wouldn't want somebody to get outputs that might disclose. And so, for example, you can't get any individual data out, right? But even the way that you might analyze or summarize the data could accidentally disclose something. But it's really just creating a barrier to say, well, can't share the data, but I can share metadata, I can share code, I can maybe even let you interact with it. Um, but I just have to create a firewall so that way. I'm not accidentally disclosing privacy issues. So I think it's a really interesting way of trying to be more open, allow exploration, um, but still have a lot of privacy kept back at the data level just because of the needs to do that um, at the patient level or the legality level. That's a really helpful example. Um, and, and so I was actually kind of curious from, from the example that you gave, I was wondering, you know, was that just you kind of sitting down with your team or did you have to bring in folks to say, oh, like these are some creative way. Like I'm a little bit curious about kind of the resources and the the minds that you had to get involved to, to make that happen. If you can talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so I think about the different data privacy levels. This is something that actually a team at MIT who developed an online platform for testing babies, which really boomed during COVID, as you can imagine, um, uh, called Look It, um, was already suggesting and developing. Uh, and we had, had to fine tune it because that one was built with a US population in mind. So to adapt it to Japan and what parents in Japan and data regulations in Japan might be, might be different. So there we went from something that people already had thought through. And I think about the video anonymization that was indeed um, a postdoc in, in the team that I work with that suggested it because I think her partners happened to work at a startup uh, that did this kind of anonymization. So it's this, yeah, so I think this was kind of this classical, you have someone that happens to know something kind of moment where we brainstormed how we could make these data. Because, you know, we're interested in where babies look uh, in these studies, because that's kind of one of our main dependent variables. So anonymization should not do anything about it. But right now, we're actually now kind of doing validation studies to run automatic gaze um, classification algorithms over data with and without anonymized faces to see whether it's actually true that we can use these data. So it actually, this synthesis project has become a, a very exciting project on its own, actually. Yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, well, and so since we're starting to talk about some um, interesting and successful, you know, open synthesis projects, I don't know that I've defined successful at all for anybody. Um, I was curious to know if there's maybe some other examples, because really one of the things I wanted to bring with this panel discussion are different ways of thinking about our data for, for these kind of unique situations and maybe open up ways for other folks to think about how to bring open synthesis to their own work. So I was curious from, you know, other panelists, if there are other projects that we could, you know, talk about and share with folks who are watching. Well, I'll jump in real quick, just um, while others think too, and it, I'll pull off the the look at example that you were doing, um, which is a great group. I, I know uh, Melissa Klein there, she used to work at COS, um, so it's a pretty cool organization. But something that's also interesting and is, is to think about, I'm just going to push it really far out, which is a lot of the synthesis is looked um, 
when we think of systematic reviews and meta-analysis, we're looking backwards, right? We're obviously doing retrospective analyses. Um, you can think about it if one's willing to do this prospectively, right? Say, okay, well, what if I want to tackle something? And I think the psychology community is a great example. So many babies is a good example of this. If you look up many babies, it's a consortium of researchers kind of all over the place. Um, some of which are very much focused and I think exactly in your realm, Shub, maybe you want to speak more, right? But this idea of like, well, we want to tackle this question, but we know that in order to do that, we need to pool our resources together and maybe purposely embrace the variability that we'll have by doing it, say, at different locations or with slight variations in our methodology. Um, so essentially look at it forward instead of just necessarily backwards. And I think that's just, it's an interesting way to think about synthesis, right? Which is, oh no, it's not just, I've got to look behind me and gather the evidence, which has its own challenges. It's, can I also do it forward sometimes? Because that, there I could actually design it and be more open in my collaboration, actually purposely break down the barriers that I know exist, such as, right? Oh, right. We're always doing this from high industrialized, you know, <laughs> populations in Europe and North America. Let's break that barrier real quick and do something prospectively forward. So I just think that's a really interesting way of thinking about it, of baking meta-analysis and systematic approaches from the get-go into large collaborative projects. Yeah, if I just can jump in there, because actually, so the video project I just talked about is a Many Babies project. It's called Many Babies at Home. Uh, so indeed, it's about like gathering, in this case, a lot of baby online data. So it's indeed a really great initiative. So I think, and what makes Many Babies successful, for instance, is that it's really built on what, our um, developmental community needs and wants. So basically people suggest projects and then they they need to gather collaborators to actually make it happen. So if you would suggest a topic that wouldn't interest a lot of people, then it would be hard to get it going. So I think it's really important to have projects that people really are interested in topic-wise, but also can gain something from, for instance, a paper with a large sample collected, et cetera. Um, and, uh, what did I wanted to say a second thing, which I lost now. So please go ahead <laughs> and I'll jump in back later. Um, I want to say that um, the psychology experiments, um, redoing it and uh, combining data <clears throat> for open science um, collaboration, um, that has been hugely successful. But <clears throat> clinical trial, I want to be realist. Clinical trial data is extremely hard to get. Um, Participants do not easily say yes to, and it's very difficult to sample and survey them. So um, I know that it's um, it'll be better if we can somehow condense the period that we collect data, but uh, um, realistically, it's very hard. And also, regulations are all different everywhere, like it's, it's country level differences as well as uh, institution level differences. So. Um, there's a little bit of a barrier there. And I, I think, Emily, if I, if I take your open synthesis broadly, I think some examples I can come up with are Prospera, I think is uh, successful. Um, I think there's well over a, probably 100 to 200,000 registrations. Um, so there's a certain openness there. And I think um, the uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality have the, uh, they have their uh, systematic review data repository, which I, I think is uh, another example um, of people willing to share. Um, I think another example is the, um, the clinical trial unit in, in, in Oxford, I mean, they're world famous for their breast cancer and IPDMAs, uh, individual patient data. And they, they've got um, agreement among research groups from around the world to share their data. And I think that's a, a very successful example. Um, I think... <clears throat> And another example I would use uh, is Prisma 2020, where we now ask specifically authors to tell us um, a number of things about data sharing, uh, code sharing. Um, and I think the, the um, last example I have uh, of a successful story is um, 
um, is the reprise project that uh, Matt Page in Monash is heading up, which is looking at uh, systematic approaches to determining how reliable uh, systematic reviews of interventions are. And I think um, medicine has been really quite slow to um, really look at these issues. And, and I would argue they should have been you know, very early on because the ramifications in, in healthcare are quite profound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, David. You said that was the Reprise project? Yes, yes, it's an R-E-P-R-I-S-E. -E. There are now two or three papers uh, published uh, in BMJ, and I know that the protocol is openly available as well. Great, great, thank you. Great. So I'm going to move on to the next question because we've talked about some, you know, successful projects. Um, and really, what I what I wanted um, you all to kind of think about and reflect on or um, taking a step back, you know, what were maybe some of the key factors that contribute to the success of these projects um, so that folks that want to do this work um, can think about ways that they can enhance these factors to ultimately, you know, have a successful open synthesis project. So I think one uh, factor is really continuity um, in terms of funding, budget, infrastructure, resources, et cetera, which um, maybe for a big project like Prisma or COS is more, probably not that easy, but more given than for smaller projects where, for instance, um, once the person that started it goes off to another job and it's a small project, then how do you actually kind of take it over? So this is something we have, for instance, with MetaLab, um, I'm not a postdoc anymore. I don't have so much time. So is there another postdoc that would want to take it over or not? And so it's a little bit dormant right now. And um, so I think, um, and it is hard, for instance, for, um, well, I guess it's hard to get open science funding in any case, but especially if the people that work on this synthesis project are not necessarily open science experts, right? So they would need to sell themselves for something that is not their core expertise. Um, I see some nods here. So I think continuity is really, really important um, and sometimes maybe hard to achieve um, if it's smaller initiatives. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I think I'll actually echo what I had said before. I think one thing that works really well is to think about what the end is. Um, and what I mean by that is really thinking hard about how one can um, make everything as as open as possible and and think about you know very clear decisions so that way you know that storyline is, is easy to follow from the reader perspective and if it deviates that's able to be followed for those that want to understand it so really that that requires just like it does in any other research project right is, is trying to say okay well it's not about the outcome it's about what and how i want to make that stuff open so these guidelines are incredibly important i think to think about uh the sources of information where where we store that, how we make it accessible, how we make it so that it's all in one place so somebody can easily identify it, especially since we still use, you know, papers generally. And to recognize that's also a moment in time. So another project, I'll just pepper this in here just because it, it popped up in my head when David was talking, is uh, living systematic reviews by the Cochrane community. It's a really interesting thing to think about, right, which is our systematic reviews, our meta-analyses. Essentially, by the time we do them, they're out of date, right, or we hope so if we're moving along fast enough. So this idea of, like, remembering, right, our own research is versioned I think is just as important. Remember, what well, we write, we version our code, we version our data, but our own research is this version. So the moment in time I do something is really important uh, to remember, including that final output. So I think that would be mine one, which is I tend to find that the ones that are really successful tend to actually narrow down and be really focus on the question and think more broadly in terms of access and openness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think... Um... It would be really good to to talk further about the living systematic reviews. It's a, it's a really interesting idea. And I, I think for me, uh, the most important factor to contributing to the, any success of open synthesis is actually whether we are going to incentivize and reward um, 
are researchers. So, you know, in my world, which may be different from everyone else's world on the panel, um, every year I, I have a, what they call a merit review. And so what they're interested in for me is, okay, David, uh, how many papers have you published? And how many papers have you published in journals with an impact factor above five? And so what I think would be much better would be to say, okay, if you've published a paper, I'm gonna give you one point. But if you've published a paper where you have the data open, I'll give you two points. Uh, if you do the data open and you got the code open, I'll give you three points. We need to start flipping around how we reward researchers with this obsessiveness of um, you know, publications. Uh, I, I was obviously, like the rest of the world, quite interested in COVID-19. And then I started to see all of these fancy trials on treatment for COVID, which is wonderful. And then I looked at all of the trials. I can't get any of the data. And so if you again go back to that great open, open, open science collaboration paper, the question is, are those COVID treatment trials reproducible? Can't get the data, can't have a look. Why are we rewarding somebody for publishing where a patient may want the data shared? You can't get anything. Who's that helping? How is that advancing anything? And I think it's exactly the same for people who are doing uh, synthesis. There's lots of um, LSRs for COVID-19. Are they sharing their data? Are they sharing their search strategies? We don't know. And I think I, uh, I'm always talking about data, but what I really mean is the full gambit. Data is no use without code. As a matter of fact, there is some evidence that people are more willing to share their code than their data. <laughs> How useful is that? Come on. So I, I think that that's um, really important. I, I think what was mentioned earlier, we need to we need funding to enable uh, open synthesis. Uh, it doesn't come from the sky. It requires resources, uh, as indicated on the panel today. Uh, some data sharing is complex and you you can't do that if you don't have any any resources and i think journals and funders need to step up to the plate uh, by and large they don't uh, to enable um, open synthesis uh, to, to really make it happen mm -hmm. yeah yeah, and it sounds a little bit like we've kind of moved into some of the barriers to open synthesis, right? Because we all agree that this is a really important thing to be doing and to be thinking about and to be planning for, but not everybody's doing it. And in fact, many scientists are not doing it. Um, and, you know, I I would actually be curious to hear about, you know, what, it, what it, in terms of infrastructure, what are the barriers to, to training and mentorship around doing open synthesis well? But but also, you know, I, I think you all, I'd love to hear from your perspective, what are some of the key barriers that we know about aside from funding, lack of funding, because everybody wants funding. <laughs> um, but what are some other key barriers that we know about to doing open synthesis and have there been some creative solutions so that we don't end on a, on a down note? <laughs> Well, um, let me jump in. <laughs> Since we talked extensively about uh, barriers to data um, um, that are present for various reasons, another thing that I um, think about the barriers is that um, data and computing codes are archived at various places with or without maintenance. So there's no good, good system to search and systematically search and retrieve them um, systematically. So oftentimes people get data through out of uh, out of uh, words of mouth. So I think that's uh, potentially um, um, a barrier. And NIMH data or Open Science Foundation have lots of data at the individual patient level, but the data that are there would not be representative of the entire evidence body of evidence in the field. So I think 
um, again, there has to be some good platform where um, data can be searched systematically, code can be searched systematically, and we can access them based on our you know, specific purpose of our synthesis. And also there's a problem of interoperability, interoperability. So uh, what they mean by, for example, alcohol use disorder, alcohol problems may not be the same in another studies. So at the item level and also scale level, there's a problem of um, you know, changeable, I guess, um, you know, definitions and um, data. And I think in general, um, more education and collaboration opportunities would be helpful um, so that um, the importance of open science is um, shared and also we have a better trust in one another. And also maybe by communicating, maybe we can build a better incentives. For example, um, we talked about paper, you know, all the career individuals are extremely stressed for publications, right? <laughs> um, Similarly, even when somebody develops an R package, I noticed that R package sometimes are not well maintained. So it ceases to work when R uh, is updated. So package doesn't work or packages has a minimal functions without ever like uh, expanding it. So I think this all suggests that there is an incentive problem. The fact that I published a package is important, but it may not be important that I'm not, I'm not maintaining it. So I think there has to be some better incentives for um, especially early career individuals to like reflect the amount of work they do um, to make it open um, science. Um, so I think um, I will end there. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think... Um... It, it, it sort of wanting to end on, on a on a higher note is, I mean, two examples to me would be the Center for Open Science and the uh, UK Reproducibility Network. I think they're doing uh, fabulous work to to um, lower barriers and to sort of facilitate um, openness in in the broadest term. I, I think you asked, uh, are, are there uh, different barriers for different scientific disciplines? Um, yeah, there definitely are. Uh, I, I would say data sharing is omni-absent in medicine. It, 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 it's not a culture. It's all about uh, me, me, me. I want to do it all. I'm not going to give anybody anything. Um, so we, we need to really develop strong educational and training we we need um, we need um, openness to be part of uh, researcher performance assessment and um, that's happening in some places uh, coara is an example in europe and um, i think um, we see that dora the declaration of research assessment is another example of where they're starting to ask people to think outside the box beyond the publication and beyond journal impact factor. Um, yeah, I think one problem is that already came up is really kind of the knowledge transmission often. So right, so for instance, there might be a student that wants to do open science, but their advisor does not or does not know how to do it. So that is something where um, with collaborators, we have tried to write tutorial papers, both on doing pre-registration and on doing a meta-analysis specifically for our field for development of scientists. For instance, Prisma is wonderful, but a student might get lost if one of the you know criteria we don't use for developmental science, we don't do RCTs, right? So we write, you don't need to use this criterion, perfect. So this is something where we think we have found some solution Another problem where I find it harder to see a good solution is the knowledge transfer across different language barriers and cultures. And again, also like the kind of advantage versus disadvantaged researcher population. And if we only talk about Japan, where I'm working right now, for instance, it is harder for Japanese researchers to access all this information in English, right? And there are some open science initiatives and workshops in Japanese, but there's only specific researchers that work on it. Um, I've also given some talks and done 
right? But of course, this is then additional workload in a sense on a few people, the few people that do it in, in a specific context, right? So, and uh, yeah, so I think there, um, and the cultural bi bi barriers might be even harder because there might be less advisors that would promote it. There might be a bit more um, uh, bad experiences with actually having shared data with actually international collaborators, um, where because of the language barriers, um, um, Asian authors have ended up not on a prominent position in a paper, although they did a lot. So they might actually already be less prone to trusting the community because they are a little bit outsiders in this weird community. And this is really something where, um, sorry, this is not a high note, but it, it is it's really hard for me to see a solution to it. But I find it really, really um, uh, very, very um, important. And even this kind of panel discussion, I mean, this is pre-recorded, so it's fine, but if you don't speak fluent English, it's harder for you to chime in, it's harder for you to ask questions. So really this whole knowledge transfer with, especially in open science, works so much over Twitter, over sparse information sharing. Um, so I I feel like the, the delay might be uh, bigger than in specific scientific fields where people are actually experts. So even though they might not be so strong in English, they can follow the topic. So yeah, this is really a hard problem. Um, that is, yeah, I'm going to see if I can take a view of, of at least how I think about it and maybe have an, a, a good end note, which is it, it does require, I think, a lot of different actors. You have to remember, like, we're in a social system. And I think um, one is to to not forget that that usually there are other individuals that are involved. David, you did a great job of, I think, listing off all of almost all of them, right? And the trick is you actually need them all to kind of work together, right? So if we're going to shift say hiring and tenure practices will the more that, that those can get aligned with funding and publication practices the higher chance of success because they're all moving up at the same rate um but i do think it's happening i think it's unfortunately slower than some of us would want and i think you know my my end note would be to to make sure that we don't one put our you know don't take our foot off the gas pedal but to recognize that, that like this is a marathon we're running at the same time and i do think there's evidence that it happens so i'll give you like a, my small anecdote of maybe some it, it is working i think which is let's look at pubmed which i think people do use as a source it's a nice database it holds a lot of nice information uh nih did a pilot on preprints and now they're extending their pilot and they're making it so anything that's you know has direct uh, linkage to nih funding is now going to be indexed in pubmed so think about that change. There's a lot of things rapidly. One, now we're starting to slowly index preprints alongside papers. It's amazing, right? It's really hard to do otherwise. I have to go scouring around different preprint servers if I wanted to do that, or what would normally happen is I'd ignore it. I'd ignore it as a research product. But the second thing it does is it also incentivizes it. It now slowly moves up the value chain. It is important. I can find it, I can use it. And now it's something that starts to get into that reward system. So it takes longer than I think we wish. And I wish it was like a, a bit of a golden bullet, but that'll be my happy note, which is it does happen. And I, and, you know, watching it slowly, it just takes some time. But once you start to see things like that PubMed, you know, and NIH policies change, it tells me that it's actually slowly, slowly working in our favor. Yeah, thank you for that. And I do, I'm I'm gonna say we're gonna have to end because we're we're at our allotted time, but um I appreciate that there have been so, some solutions and also that there are still barriers and and I and naming those in this session is really important because now we we know how to kind of con continue to keep pushing forward. So I just want to thank this wonderful panel for sharing your experience and your reflections. I've really enjoyed the discussion. Um and thank you all for for listening and and being a part of Esmarconf 2023.